Welcome to the Keeping in Nostalgia live show. I am your host, Billy Powell. Uh, you can go to YouTube, just type in the YouTube search bar there, Keeping in Nostalgia live show. You'll see most of our shows on there. Um, a, a lot of shows are still going to be on our uh, podcast site, which is Keeping the Nostalgia Live. Podbean.com. That's all one word, Keeping the Nostalgia Live. Podbean.com. We've had some greats on there Kent Benson, Rick Mount, Coach Gene Cady. Um, even some interesting where you may not recognize the name, but you got to listen to the story. So um, all about uh, most 95% of them about the great game of basketball in the state of Indiana. Uh, I've got some baseball and football and some music tossed in there too, but uh, please check out keeping nostalgia live.podbean.com and the keeping the nostalgia live show on YouTube. As you can see with us today, our guest is Dave Warland. Uh, Dave, thank you so much for uh, taking some time out of your schedule uh, to uh, help keep the nostalgia alive and uh, talk about uh, your your life. Well, I'd love to do that. I'm honored. And uh, you just mentioned a few folks on there you've had on there. So I don't know if I can match up with some of those uh, fellas, but I'll, I'll do my very best to tell you my story. You know, uh, Dave is one of those where I've been doing this uh, to let everybody know I've been doing this for eight, nine, 10 years. And um, you know, you learn something new about the game of basketball, especially high school basketball, um, uh, every day. I thought I knew it all. I don't. Uh, and Dave kind of slipped under the radar. There's some great stories that uh, I hope Dave can share. And uh, I'm going to share one story. And it's a cathedral story. Dave used to was 20 years the principal at Cathedral High School. And we're going to talk about his capacity now and what he does uh, for the school. Uh, but uh, I was a freshman in high school. Um, cathedral was ranked number two. It was 1983. Um, one of our, I went to Broadwell High School. Donnie Harris on our team was fouled by a uh, cathedral uh, Irish. Uh, he went to the line, sank two, and uh, ended the season for cathedral, who was ranked number two in the state. Uh, so that's one of my memories about cathedral. I have great memories while being at Broadwell High School and uh, cathedral, but uh, we're going to go to Lafayette, Indiana. Dave, tell us a little bit about where you were born and raised and tell us a little bit about your family. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, well, born and raised in, in Lafayette. I was actually born in Fowler, Indiana, so kind of a Benton County guy, but I was less than a year old when mom and dad took my three older brothers and, and I to Lafayette. He was in the furniture business. Uh, people have been around for a while, probably would remember Village Furniture in Lafayette. So my dad uh, started that business and, and um, my three older brothers, uh, Terry, Bob, and Jim, uh, were in grade school when we moved to Lafayette. Of course, uh, we moved right across the street to Lafayette Central Catholic, the, the high school there. Just been built probably for about eight, 10 years. And so uh, as mom and dad kind of ran the business, uh, we all went to, to the grade school. St. Mary's was the Catholic school at that time is K through eight. So we were very fortunate to have a, an outstanding grade school education. We're taught by the, the sisters and uh, the priest there. Monsignor Potoff was our pastor. And, and then uh, we all just kind of would hang out. Uh, we'd cross 9th Street and go to uh, CC across the street, and we kind of just lived there half the day, and then we'd go to school the other part of the day, and then summers we were home half the day and on the grounds of, of Central Catholic the rest of the time. Uh, was your dad athletic? He was. Uh, he was He was involved in, in a lot of the sports at Fowler High School back then. Um, didn't go on beyond high school, but but he, he loved athletics. He, he had it uh, in his... Uh, genes to to follow sports like most people uh, did back then and even today but um, he kind of instilled in us to you know to compete and, and have fun and uh, but also work hard and make a buck or two by the time you get out of high school or college so that you can you know, take care of your family what was your first love was it uh, baseball was it basketball football what, what what was their first sport that you, you remember kind of uh getting excited about or, or, or wanting to play or, you know, falling in love with? Yeah, well, it, it was definitely baseball. John Everly was the head baseball coach uh, in my early years and was for a long time at Lafayette Central Catholic. So when I was like in kindergarten, first grade through seventh grade, uh, one of my friends, Bob Bollinger and I were the bat boys for Central Catholic's baseball team. So we always wanted to, to be, baseball players. So we, we played a lot and we, you know, we were involved in a lot of the baseball teams, uh, you know, growing up in Lafayette, but uh, it was really John Everly that kind of inspired that, uh, 
uh, love of baseball. So that was always my number one love. But, but basketball was right there behind it. You know, every court in the neighborhood had a had a basket. So or you know, a garage. So we we were able to play a lot more basketball just because uh, unless you had a few other guys to to catch the fly balls or to throw batting practice to you you could always play by yourself in basketball work on your jump shot and dribbling and those kind of things so baseball one basketball two but uh, I love them both um so you know I was born and raised in Indianapolis so I guess because I was where I was at geography geographically I'm, I was a Reds fan so you guys being a little bit north I'm assuming you were either a Cubs or a White Sox fan or fill me in on what kind of fan you were Oh, big time Cubs, diehard Cubs all the way. My dad and his dad were big Cub fans. And, uh, quick story. Uh, yeah, very much Cubs. But um, when the Cubs uh, went to the playoffs, um, it's hard to get playoff tickets, obviously. But the, it was back in the days when you had the rotary phones. And I was try- trying to get two tickets to the Cubs World Series or playoffs, whichever it would be. And I got through and I got two tickets and got a hold of someone. I mean, I did it for like three hours, just kept speed dialing, speed dialing, speed dialing. I got two tickets. And, um, and of course, they said, do you want to go to the playoffs or do you want to go to the World Series? You know, if you go to the World Series, they may not get there. But if they get there, you get two tickets. So I said, I, you know, I'm going for the gusto, man. I, I, we're, playoffs will be nice. But, but the World Series, my dad always promised me he was going to take me to the World Series. Well, as it turned out, uh, I told dad, so he and I were going to go to the world series. It was kind of a flip-flop because at that time dad was retired and I was you know, young enough that I could get him there. Uh, so he was excited. I was excited. Um, even Jeff Washburn, who's a sports writer, the journal courier at that time, Lafayette journal courier, I told him a story and it kind of became a big story around the country because it was a flip-flop, you know, the, the kid who was going to go with his dad, the world series to see the Cubs was going to take his dad because at that time dad was in his seventies. Um, well, sadly they got beaten in the playoffs. We didn't get to the world series that year. Uh, it was in the eighties, somewhere in one of those years that they went to the playoffs. So, but no diehard Cubs, you know, when they won, uh, I had my two sons with me when they did win the world series, dad had been deceased uh, 10 years when they won it here a handful of years back. So we, we were one of those uh, Cubs fans that finally got a little bit of joy uh, when they won the World Series here. Back oh, the- did you have a favorite player on the Cubs? Was your favorite player on additional baseball team or oh, a different baseball team? Ernie, Ernie was the man, you know. I, I was, of course, Kessinger and Beckert, uh, you know, that double play combination were in there. Ron Sano, Billy Williams, um, you know, I, I loved them all. But but Ernie's the, he was my hero, idol. Um, he was He was pretty special. It's interesting in everybody that we interview, I asked that and, you know, uh, below Indianapolis, Southern Indiana is flows toward the Cardinals, you know, that Indianapolis area, just a little bit South, the the Reds, but, you know, uh, it's it's interesting how we become uh, uh, fans of our environment. Oh, without a doubt. And, you know, a lot of my good friends, uh, Mark Andrews, one of my good friends, he's a big White Sox fan. So we, we still battle. He grew up in Lafayette as well. So we, we have some good times. My son-in-law, he grew up in Cincinnati. Uh, he's a big Reds fan. So you're right. It's kind of wherever you're at, you kind of love the, the team you're in. And uh, you remember all those uh, great wins. You try to forget about all those tough years. You know, you always remember the, the championships and the big wins. You forget about those years uh, that maybe the Cubbies were in last place, you know, back in the, the, the heydays back when, you know. Yeah, and at least the Cubs and the White Sox have done the right thing and won a World Series in the past, you know, years. So that at least you can you can relish that with also thinking about all the hard times. Oh, without a doubt, yeah, those are the ones that you uh, you, you remember the certain plays and you remember certain events during the, the high times and the, the low times. You still uh, you still love them. I mean, if you're not a, a diehard, even you got to hang with them when they're in the the cellar. At the same time, they're in the, the way up, or you're you're not a real fan. Um, so three older brothers, right? Correct. So you kind of have, you, you, you kind of, okay, I'm sorry. Um, so you kind of had a little bit of an idea of what you were getting yourself into when you went to Central Catholic. Oh yeah. Without a doubt. I mean, they were, like I said, we lived right across the street. So my brothers, uh, when we lived there in Sarasota Drive, they'd hear the, the tardy bell from the school. 
because you could hear it from our house because our house was like just right there it was just you know like a uh, hundred steps you're 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 right there walking inside so they would go to school when they heard the tardy bell because <laughs> the they had five minutes and they get there in one minute so and i hadn't left yet i was still going to st uh, mary's at the time so we had a carpool so they uh they they were there and they you know they kind of prepped me a little bit uh sometimes for the good and sometimes uh for the not so good because if they, if they ever did something that uh wasn't good then when i came over there they'd say well you're so-and-so's uh little brother and he did so-and-so over here you know a little little teasing thing so so yeah i was ingrained in the, all the the goodness of uh central catholic in those early years and and became to to really love the school and um proud to be a graduate there of 1973 so what did did you get into basketball first was there uh, how how were the seasons set up did they have a football team they did and uh of course when i went there 69 was my freshman year they had an undefeated team the football as far as football had a really good team that year that's before the playoffs so there was no such thing as a playoff so they were 10 and 0 so they kind of called themselves a state champ, even though there were other teams that were 10 and 0 in the state, but you know, Hey, everybody thinks they're the ones that's a 10 and 0. So, so we had a really good football team. We always had some really competitive basketball teams. I mean, I would watch like Bill Cutter and Henry Ebershoff and um, Wayne Dean Hart. And a lot of guys when I was in the younger years who, uh, who played for central Catholic in baseball, football, basketball, and all that. So I had a lot of, uh, older guys that were high school age that I would love to go see and play. And even back then, this was back in the, you know, like in the sixties, mid sixties, we would actually have some games on TV, you know, Lafayette Jeff would play on TV, Central Catholic At that time, you know, Harrison McCutcheon were split out into smaller schools, but um, it was really neat because uh, it was a big deal. You know, people would say, you know, Hey, this is the whole technology is, is really great, but, you know, what was it like back then, but there was, you know, good games, uh, games of the week. Everybody knew who was playing when, where, and how, and uh, the schedules were such that uh, it couldn't get to the game for a lot of them. You could, you could watch them on TV, the local TV stations. And so, so how, how did it go? Did, did you, did you play freshman basketball? And then it was there a varsity freshman junior varsity uh, uh, baseball team? How, how did your sports career at Central Catholic go? Yeah, well, the sports career went with, I liked cross country, so I'd kind of run cross country in the in the off season and wasn't uh, one of the top runners by any shape or means, but it kept me in shape and it kept me uh, disciplined in, in the, the fall because I didn't play football, but I did run cross country. But then in the winter, played all four years of basketball, you know, freshman year, played on the freshman team, sophomore year, the JV team, junior year, played uh, uh, JV and some varsity, and then senior year, you know, I played all varsity um, on a really great team. We had a lot of great players my senior year at Lafayette Central Catholic. So it was kind of that standard uh, role. We we had a lot of good athletes, and you had to work really hard uh, then as it is today if you wanted to ultimately play on the varsity team. A lot of competition, a lot of good uh, athletes. We had great coaching. Um, it was when you didn't have the off-season stuff. If you wanted to get to be a better player in the off-season, it wasn't the AAUs. It wasn't the uh, – organized Nike camps and all that uh, you went down to Bishop's woods and you got four or eight other guys and said, let's go play. And you'd play outdoors down at the Bishop's woods, or you'd uh, maybe uh, get our coach or sneak in the back door at the gym and go in the gym and shoot around um, on a night or a weekend or summertime. So uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, and again, we, we had the neighborhood boys that would get together and we'd play outdoors in the outdoor courts. So uh, we we enjoyed it and um, and we we were outside a lot and we were running around the neighborhood. It's a little different back then. Like I said, no no emails, no technology, no computers. Um, you pretty much uh, were were outdoors and unless you were doing homework inside. Uh, but it was fun and we had a great. Uh, even the the folks uh, that were in the neighborhoods would you know kind of take care of us. Uh, it was a neat neighborhood. If they went to the public school, the private schools, whatever, we'd hang out. Some of my best friends you know, ended up going to Lafayette Jeff. And when we'd play against Lafayette Jeff, um, it was kind of neat because uh, when we'd play, you know, we were best buddies in the neighborhood. And then all of a sudden we're in a sectional championship game 
in Crawley Center, uh, kind of working to to beat each other. And um, there, there was one time in our in my senior year, Vint Vaughn was in my class going through grade school, and Vint and I were just talking. He was on a free throw or something, probably third quarter of the game, and and that was when Jeff had won 29 straight sectional championships, Marion Crawley most of those years, and. Um, but but then I just kind of looked at each other at a, a, on the floor during a, uh, a free throw and said, would you ever imagine that we would be competing against each other at the varsity level in a jam-packed house of, uh, you know, rabid fans for Jeff and CC? Um, but those are the, the memories. The memories are great when you win or they're great, but it's always the guys that you competed with or the guys you um, played against that really make those memories special. You know, baseball was just coming into it, especially with ISHAA and having a tournament and everything. Was it based, was it set up as sectionals also during your career with baseball? And was it the same sectional as it was in basketball? It was very similar. Of course, that was a one class back then, of course. But uh, yes, it was, uh, even though football didn't have a tournament run, baseball did. You had a baseball sectional, uh, one class. So, you know, the big schools, little schools all played against each other. Um, and it was um, usually the same teams, but not always. You know, it kind of depend on the, the geographical setup. Not all teams had a baseball team, uh, but most did. Almost everybody had a basketball team. So you did have sectionals. You had regional, seven state, state, just like they do today. And again, that was, you know, like I said, that was back in the in the sixties and in seventies when when early seventies when I was in high school. So it, it wasn't a lot different, other than the fact that, you know, there was a lot more teams back then. So our sectional would have maybe you know there's a lot of six and eighteen sectionals now. Well, back then there was sectionals that had fourteen, sixteen teams in it. You know, just as I said, Harrison McCutcheon alone, you know, I could roll out seven or eight teams that fed into those, you know, Southwestern and Klondike and um, the schools that fed into those. So those all had high school teams. So it was kind of neat because, um, you know, back then, you know, when you when you competed, uh, if you won a sectional sometimes back in those 60s, I mean, you had to win five games to win a sectional. It wasn't a you know, three games and in, in, in. So it was competitive, but but it meant a lot too. If you were able to get to that championship game and if you were fortunate enough to win, um, there was a kind of that pride factor to say, wow, we, we made it through. And usually you knew the guys on the team. So you kind of had that uh, reminder factor you'd tell them when you get to be older. Every year you get older, you can't tell them about that high school years, you know? So So was Al Brown there the whole term that you were there at Central Catholic? He was not. Uh, my freshman year, John Everly was the, the basketball coach. And uh, John uh, Everly, who I think the world of, um, the, the, he was um, let go. I mean, there was a, the community, um, and he rest his soul right now. John passed uh, many years ago. But um, it, even back then, this was 1969, uh, Billy, and uh, the the, the I, I can't say who it is because I don't know who it is, but a decision was made uh, to terminate his contract. And what was really neat, the the powers to be back then got him a job at Lafayette Jeff teaching and coaching. So he didn't lose his income because everybody loved John Everly. He was a great baseball coach and he helped coach over at, Laf- or over at Jeff. But they did because he wasn't winning enough games. I'll, I'll just kind of say it. He wasn't winning enough sectional. Jeff had won 29 straight years. I think somebody wanted to see if we could get a run because we had some really good athletes, as I said earlier, at Lafayette Central Catholic. So long story short, they looked for a new coach. And uh, they found an awesome coach. You know, At that time, Coach Brown was over at Purdue doing some coaching over there. And, again, um, the, the folks in charge of Central Catholic uh, kind of was able to convince him to – take his coaching at the high school level at Lafayette Central Catholic. And in three years, he uh, built uh, a team that won a sectional championship. Uh, uh, What are some of your memories of Coach Al Brown? Well, uh, my early memories, you know, it it was my sophomore year was the first year. And I probably don't remember anybody that was quite as organized as he was. I mean, he was just so – uh, organized with paperwork and, and uh, programs. I mean, he would get, he'd write um, all kinds of wonderful things up 
for the program. And, and, and again, back in that time, that wasn't the norm. I mean, you got people sometimes, you know, sports writers that are doing that for you now, but he was super organized and very dedicated. I mean, and very knowledgeable. I mean, he was so, uh, he was ahead of his time, I believe, back then, uh, dealing with maybe some of the psychology of coaching, dealing with some of the, the, um, the specifics. I, I kind of say sometimes um, defense back then was just kind of staying by your man, you know, just, just make sure your man doesn't get too far away from you. There wasn't technique involved it, that I remembered as a junior high or even as I got a little older, but, but he taught the fundamentals of defense. You know, this is where you stand and this is how you help. And this is the timing. And we did shell drills and it was a, it was, it was new. It was, it was a new level of, uh, of training and teaching that, that I sure had not seen. And I think I can speak for a lot of guys that were on our team. It was a, uh, it was a, a ramp up to, hey, if we're going to spend this time for these two hours of practice, we're going to get after it. We're going to we're going to learn. This is a classroom. You know, Coach Brown was always a he was a teacher uh, first and then he was kind of a coach second. Uh, he, he, he taught us the fundamentals. He, he let us know this is the way we're going to do it. And, you know, and there wasn't any. You know, you could always, you know, kind of ask questions to understand it better, but but you you weren't going to ask him why because you just do it his way, <laughs> and and you know, and he got an instant credibility. You know, the older guys, like I said, I was a sophomore the first year, but those those guys that were seniors that year, I mean, they 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 were they were successful and and did better. So the program just kind of Al Ricks was someone that became a really good player, and I think if you talk to Al Ricks today. He'd say Coach Brown, you know, was the one who helped him become a really good basketball player and got him a college scholarship. Um, I mean, it it plays out like a like the movie Hoosiers, or you know, it it, it should be a movie. I mean, Lafayette Jeff won the sectional twenty nine years in a row. I mean, it, was that the conversations in coffee houses and and bars and and did I mean, you know, take us through you know, getting to that season, but, you know, did you even in your mind think we were going to win sectional that year and, and do as well as you guys did, which you had a a phenomenal season. Right. Well, I'll back up a little bit because of Lafayette, Jeff, over the years, us guys that were at CC, we saw their success. And Marion Crawley was an outstanding coach. So we saw that from a distance. I don't care if we're in first grade or seventh grade, eighth grade. Um, and really with, with Marion Crowley, whenever they won a sectional all those years when we were little, he didn't make a big deal about it. I don't even think they didn't even cut down the nets. It was like, let's get this thing over with, you know, in, in a modest way, not in a, uh, an uppity way, but it was just that level of success that, that he brought to Lafayette Jeff was, hey, we're planning to go to the semi state. You know, we're, we're going to win this sectional, you know, let's just get it going and get it over with. Let's go to the regional. We're going to win that one outright. Now, some state, okay, we're bringing teams down from the, you know, from the region, and we got some pretty darn good schools come down. And then that's when they started to cut down the nets. They cut the nets down at some state, the regional and, and you know, sectional, not so much. So, so, so we saw that. I mean, in '64, uh, they won a state championship at Lafayette Jeff, and those guys were, you know, they weren't just the Lafayette Jeff idols. They were the guys like us, the the, the grade school kids who watched them play. So. Um, so we saw that. We saw the success in that area. So fast forward to Coach Brown, uh, you asked, did we think we were going to win the sectional? Absolutely, we thought we were going to win. And it, for two reasons. One, we had some talent. And we had uh, Tom Cutter was our leading scorer, leading rebounder. Tommy went on to play at Western Michigan. He was awesome. So, so it was no fluke. I mean, we, we knew we had some some good talent. Mark Andrews, Kevin Crow, you know, Bill Lottie, Bobby Reilly. I mean, it goes on and on. We had some really good players that year. So so that's number one. But number two, I go back to Coach Brown being so organized. He had an excellent assistant coaching staff. Tim Wolf was on his staff. Tim was a great basketball coach. Bill Bogan was doing a lot of scouting for him. And he had all he, he it was like a, a college program from the standpoint of preparation. So we knew when the teams got off the bus, how we were going to guard them, who was going to guard who. So we believed we could win only because we knew 
we were prepared. Now, it was no easy task because, um, you know, we, we had to beat um, the, the Friday before we beat Lafayette Jeff. We beat Jeff by one point in the sectional to win. And it was back and forth. I mean, they were tough too. But the night before on Friday, we went overtime with West Lafayette. Mark Andrews hits a free throw in overtime, one free throw. They were tied, I forget what it was, 55-55 in regulation. One point was scored in overtime. Mark hits a free throw somewhere in the middle of the overtime. Nobody else scored. So it wasn't a cakewalk, but every time we were on the floor, we were going to compete. And, and if, we were, if we would have lost either of those games, it wasn't because we weren't prepared and we didn't work hard and we weren't you know, playing together. It was just because, you know, hey, ball didn't bounce our way at the end of the game or whatever. Uh, so it, is it true that coach Al Brown said you guys were going to walk home at halftime if you didn't win? <laughs> That's true. I think that, I think, yes, I, I'm not, you know, and, and I say that only because, um, he would say some things sometimes and, and we believed him, you know, he, he wasn't just blowing smoke. If he, if he said we're going to do something, then we would. So if we were lost, I guarantee, well, the good thing is, you know, if people know life yet, it's not that far walk. I mean, Jeff's on ninth street or at 18th street, we were on ninth street. So we, you know, nine blocks. I mean, let's face it. That's, that's kind of far, but not too bad, but yeah, we would, we might've walked home that night. I, think I, I read where one parent couldn't take it and, and actually walked home to listen to it at, at the house. That is true. That was Tom Cutter's father. Uh, Mr. Cutter was watching the game. Um, very good fan, just a loving guy. Uh, but he would get real nervous at the games and, and he would, he, I don't think he ever did it during the regular season, but he'd get nervous in regular season too. But yeah, he, I don't even think it got to be halftime. It was just, and it was nip and tuck. I mean, actually Jeff went up first half on us like seven or eight points. I remember and I think that might've been the time uh, Mr. Cutter walked home and he listened to it on the radio and heard about the championship from the radio. So uh, that is so true. And, um, and if you, anybody was in Crowley center that game, I mean, the fire marshal, uh, would have probably shut us down because, um, uh, it was, it was jam packed and, uh, it's what a high school basketball is all about, should be all about. Uh, it was all about the fans and the cheering and the pride and, and all those kind of things. And, and even the, the folks from Lafayette Jeff, although they were, Sad, I'm sure, disappointed that they lost. Uh, they're very gracious as well because, again, we're all in the same community. And, uh, they, they, they were happy for us, but at the same time, they wish we didn't win because they wanted Jeff to win. Uh, so, what was the size of what did Central Catholic get get to choose from compared? Uh, what were the sizes of Jeff and Catholic uh, uh, comparison wise? Right. Well, <clears throat> Central Catholic, probably in its heyday, back in the uh, early, maybe in 1960, might have been the largest uh, it had ever been. It, it was at that time, it's now a junior, senior high school, but way back then it was a co-ed nine through 12. Um, I think that the highest uh, enrollment was 600 in the heyday, like 1960 or so. By that time in 73, that year, you know, we were smaller uh, and we were probably about 410. I think each class is about 100 kids, you know. So in that time with Jeff, you know, Jeff, they were the big school. So they were right in that uh, probably 3,500 range of kids co-ed, 9 through 12 back in then. So they were still the, the kingpins. I mean, they, they, they had the numbers and they had the tradition and, um, and all that. But, but a lot of the kiddos that, uh, uh, that, that played a lot of athletics – um, could, would kind of split between Central Catholic and Lafayette because Central Catholic was was built in the, the late uh, 1950s, like 1957. And a lot of the folks who, who put that vision together um, came from really a strong athletic families, you know, the Flins and the Bogans and the, the, the they, and so they sent their kids there. So we had our share. Uh, we, and that was before girls athletics, even, you know, back then, even when I was a senior. We had GAA, Girls Athletic Association. So there wasn't I just a sport for girls back then, sadly, because, you know, a lot of the girls that were in my class and older than myself at all schools in Indiana didn't get a play in IHSA basketball. They, they played GAA, and it was kind of like, wasn't much. It, was, it wasn't very competitive. Officials weren't 
involved. But anyway, it was uh, it was it was a great time. It was a great era. We had a lot of fun. Uh, we learned a lot in the losses as well as the wins. And um, some of my dear friends today were, were were teammates and and opponents and and family members of neighbors that uh, that really uh, loved their schools. A lot of pride. You know, we're talking a lot of athletics here, but there's a lot of other cool things going on at our schools back then that uh, built our character and gave us opportunities that we were able to get to today. Uh, so you guys uh, win the regionals and then you get to play in assembly hall, correct? No, we actually went to Mackey arena. Oh, we, okay. We got to go okay. To the, yeah. The regional was at uh, Crawley center, same place. We played the section with Lafayette Jeff. Um, so we won both those games. It's two game regional. We go to the semi state, which is in Mackey arena, which, Again, what a dream, you know, being able to play in Mackey Arena. It wasn't even very old back then. And Mackey Arena was, was opened in 69. Mm-hmm. So we're playing there in 73. Four years after that, it just, you know, broke the ribbon to open it up. Um, and again, full house, great game. We played Lebanon in the first game. Lebanon had beat us in the regular season. We only lost four games regular season, but Lebanon was one of those losses. The Walker boys played for them, and they had a really good team. Uh, and they got to the semi state. They didn't get there by luck. So, uh, but we had one of our better games, I think, at that time. Um, and kind of beat them going away. I think it might have ended up eight or nine, but we pretty much had control of the game. Um, but so we got a little revenge from the regular season game. Um, and then we went to the championship. Go ahead. Continue. Yeah. And so we played South Bend Adams in the championship game. And they had a, an, an awesome team. Uh, they came down. Um, from South Bend and, and we're really talented um, and they beat us uh, seven points you know good game but they just uh, it was back then you know and it, it's still today sometimes teams have played two games in one day and we had uh, we were uh, not able to play the first game we played the second game against uh, Lebanon and so we didn't have a lot of downtime no excuse I mean they they beat us and they were better and you know hats off to them they went to the final four but we're one game away of going to to assembly hall that back then that's where you get assembly hall because the final four that year was at assembly hall that was before um, some of the larger indianapolis uh, areas were, were formed and um, had the, the places they're now playing in the bigger bigger gyms and bigger places so during your senior year, you're thinking about, you know, where am I going to go to college? What am I going to do with my life? What were your choices? Where did you choose? And who kind of led you to those decisions? Right. Well, two people. Uh, my dad, he, he led me to the decision that I should probably, uh, they call it gap year these days. Back then, um, he wanted me to work in his business. I had three older brothers. They all went in the furniture business. Uh, didn't. Uh, Terry, my oldest brother, did go to college at Marion College, um, but he kind of went right into his furniture business, dad's furniture business. Uh, Bob and Jim uh, went to the war. That was the Vietnam War was going on. So right out of high school, they both went to the Vietnam War. They came back, worked for my dad. uh, And Terry came back from Marion um, College and worked for him. So dad thought it would be a good idea for me to not go to college and just work for him. And so... Um, so he was one. So that was my influencer. So I did that. I, I didn't go to college after my first year because I was going to work in the business. Well, right when I got out of um, high school, I worked under Al Brown as a uh, head eighth grade coach. So I'm coaching eighth grade basketball for Central Catholic, working at the furniture store during the rest of the time. And uh, Coach Brown kind of took me to the side, maybe second semester of the school year and said, why, why, why aren't you going to, you know, go to college? And I said, well, dad wants me to run the business, help the business. You know, he's, he's got a big time ideas. And, and here's the thing that the dad would tell me, he'd say, help me understand this, Dave, you want to pay to go to college. And I want to train you and pay you while you're being trained. So dad's philosophy was, and he didn't go to college. He said, why would you want to pay to go to college for four years and get debt? built up where I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm the best teacher you can ever get. I'm better than any of those Purdue professors. I'm better than anybody there. I'm going to teach you how to run a business entrepreneurship. 
So it kind of made sense. And of course, you know, at that time, you know, money was like, if you were anything and anybody, you, you had to make a good living. You know, that's how people would gauge how successful you were. Where Al Brown then took me aside and said, okay, that's good. But why don't you just give it a shot? Why don't you, why don't you, why don't you get you get a teaching degree? Then if you want to go work in the furniture store, go do it. So he inspired me to go to Purdue that next year. And then I ended up going to Purdue in three years and two summers to get my degree so that I could teach and coach and, and go that direction. So I did. I gave up the furniture business. Again, my three older brothers were highly successful in that. I was the black sheep uh, of the family, so to speak, in a good way, I guess. I'm not saying that in a bad way, but I, I didn't take that path. I didn't go to the retail furniture business. I went into teaching and coaching, which was my love. And it's my love today. Uh, was, was dad upset? He, I wouldn't say he was upset. He was disappointed. And he just thought I was, wasn't quite all there. <laughs> he just, he, he just couldn't get the other state. He, he was disappointed, but he still loved me. And he still supported me. Um, but he, he thought I made a, a poor choice. Now I'll fast forward. Um, with the Two weeks before my dad passed, um, he did tell me he was very proud of me and, and that I made that choice. So he never told me that before. He, he was, he was still kind of shaking his head all during my career up until then. Like, you kidding me? Are you, you know, but in any event, yeah, he, we, we did have a nice conversation, um, which, which filled my heart because he did give me the kind of the thumbs up that, you know, that he did realize that at some point in time that I, I made a good decision. So same question for at Purdue. What did you think you were going to do? Did you have an idea that you wanted to continue coaching? Uh, who helped you along the way? And what was it like getting your degree at Purdue and then going out and finding a job? Yeah, well, it, yeah, I went straight, just like Coach Brown had said, uh, I really went to Purdue. Of course, it's right across the river. So, I mean, Purdue was part of my life. I mean, I was I went to all the events and programs. And when you live, in Lafayette, you're practically on the campus of Purdue. So it, it wasn't a big change for me because I hung around Purdue some anyway when I was a little bit older and would go to the events. So so I didn't, I went in fraternities. I, I, I lived in a, in a house with a couple of my friends, um, Billy Milady, uh, Tommy Cutter, um, were, were a good buddy. So we had a house on the east side and, and I, I did a little work part-time and, but I got my degree. I got it fast. So I did it on the fast track. And the reason I did it was I knew I wanted to be a teacher and coach. I mean, that's, that was my love. I mean, I, I, I couldn't wait to be a real educator teacher. You know, I was doing a lot of substitute teaching. That was part of my part-time job. So when I was going to Purdue as a student. Um, I knew I wanted to be a teacher or coach. I mean, I wanted to, to do it as quickly as I could. So when I was making a few bucks to pay my tuition, as my dad would have said before, how are you going to pay your tuition? question well I was making it by substitute teaching you know while I was in college and uh, and, I, and I went to life and I, it was a great experience I anybody who's listening if they're thinking they want to be a teacher and they're you know in college or they're in that age group go and substitute teach the elementary schools middle schools high schools first of all we need a lot of good substitute teachers but two it's where you get your foot in the door and you find out what's really like so so I did that uh like I said, graduated in three years and two summers. As soon as I got out of, um, and, and during all those years, I was still coaching under Coach Brown. You know, I was coaching some eighth grade basketball in my early years. Then I became the JD coach at CC when I was like a, a second year at Purdue. My last year at Purdue, my third year, um, I was like assistant varsity coach under Tim Wolf. By that time, Coach Brown had moved on and uh, Tim Wolf took over. So Tim kept me on his staff. So I was like his varsity assistant. So I, I got great exposure, great experience because I'm, I'm traveling practices. I'm at all the, the games as a college student. But when I got out of college, I continued to coach for two years in Lafayette. I went to St. Lawrence, was a seventh and eighth grade teacher. So I got my first real teaching job and got paid. I think back then, I think I was, I think I thought I died and went to heaven. I was making $9,000 as a teacher, you know, so, so this is like at 70 six or something. Uh, I really didn't even know what I made. I don't think at the time I didn't care. I just, what, what's uh, sister James told me she was going to hire me as a teacher. Uh, it, she came and even caught me. I was, I was going to the car leaving and she said, David, um, 
you want to know what you make as a teacher? And I said, not really. I, I said, I said, I, you're a sister, you're a nun, you're, you're not going to cheat me, I'm sure. And she said, okay, well, you're going to make it $9,000. I said, okay, that's great. I, I'll take it, you know. So, so I did that for two years. And, and then I got my first head coaching job uh, at Washington Catholic High School two years after I was at CC, those last two years helping Coach Wolf and then getting a, a good start as a teacher at uh, St. Lawrence. Um, so did you, because you kind of started the feeder system when you went to Washington Catholic, did you learn that from Coach Al Brown? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I plagiarized about anything and everything I could get my hands on, uh, whether it was his handbook, whether it was his style, whether, and, and other people too. I mean, there were other influencers that were other coaches that I would have came across. Uh, one of the assistant coaches at, at Central Catholic was a, a guy named Denny Hoff, very strong technician of the game. Um, and there was many, many other people that um, that I would come across that I'd meet in the coaching profession. Uh, Danny Dawson, good example. Danny uh, went to Benton Central. He was an excellent high school basketball coach. I got to be friends with him. So the, the list was endless of people that would help uh, – form me but but as most professions go you got to be yourself at some time you you can take and steal and plagiarize and copy anything and everything people style but you're not going to really be able to to withstand the long term success or involvement unless you really take it to be yourself and you form your own um years and 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 at Washington Catholic uh Billy I was given the opportunity. Um, Sister Joseph Luis was my boss. She was a superintendent and principal, and she let me do whatever I wanted within reason. I mean, she wouldn't let me go crazy on something, but but I was able to start a program. There was a little bit of school uh, who had success uh, in the past um, at different times. They had good athletes, and but they had they hadn't won a sectional there since 1947. And so they were hungry. So they got this rookie out of Lafayette, Indiana, and gave me a chance. And, and you know, after three years, we were fortunate to, to, to build some winning teams. And, you know, we even had some teams that were ranked in the state back then. It was single A, but a little bitty Washington Catholic because we had some good players. I had some excellent assistant coaches that were from that area, Morris Petty, Tom Tucker, Andy Igo, um, people who, who worked well together. And, uh, and, and some really good athletes that ended up um, being very successful. And, and we were fortunate to win a sectional in 1985. You know, we beat Jack Butcher and Ligoti on a Friday night. Um, we had a, a good chance to, uh, you know, play against Bar Reed and beat them, you know, right towards the end. And um, so great memories there, you know, but uh, I was kind of young and dumb still because I was still, you know, in my mid 20s. So I, I probably didn't know half as much as I thought I did, but I just went by the seat of my pants and I had some good, good people, a good principal. And, you know, I, I just kind of led with my, my gut. And then finally I was able to probably figure some things out. I, the year before we won the sectional, here's a good example. Joe Todrank was the uh, basketball coach at Bar Reeve. What a character, by the way. Oh, he's quite a character. And Joe's become one of my best friends. He mentored me. So I, here I moved to, to Washington, Indiana. I'd never been there in my life. I didn't know there was such a thing as Washington, Indiana. So I didn't know anybody down in Southern Indiana. But I was excited about going to the school. Well, Joe kind of took me in, um, mentored me, didn't have to. I mean, he just was a good guy. But he is a character and, 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 and was good to me. Well, that junior year, we had a better team our junior year when um, – the year before we won that sectional in 85. So in 84, we were better than Bar Reef. We played them in the sectional. We were hands down. We had better talent. We, we had a better regular season. And Joe outcoached me. Joe slowed the game down. He played the old, you know, delay game. And I was not prepared for it. The head coach didn't have that. In my, I didn't have that in my resume of, uh, of, of plays, you know. So I was like, calling timeouts, trying to figure out how to do it. And, um, and we lost. So, uh, and I took full credit for that loss. And so 
luckily the kids that were junior that year and a couple of sophomores came back the next year and we won the sectional and um but that's where you you know you learn you know i I didn't throw the towel in, but I did say, and here's my good friend, Joe, you know, the good thing was, here's Joe, the class guy, Joe Todrank comes into our locker room and just applauds our kids. And we just got done outsmarting their head coach and those kids, you know, their heads were in their laps crying, but Joe came, patted each one of them in the head, said, hey, sun's going to rise tomorrow. Everything will be fine. And then Joe goes back to his locker room and he greets my wife because my wife loved Joe. And so she, Janet's in there crying because Washington Catholic got beat, but Joe gives her a big hug. And, you know, it, it all comes down to the friendships you make and you, you always want to win, but you got to find something in a loss that you can take with you. But we all learned so much that year. And, and thank goodness I was mentored by people like Joe Todrank, Gary Duncan, Stan Neal, Jack Butcher. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on. These are people that, um, you know, they they go to battle for each other. You know, I do the same for them. They went to my wedding, you know, these these coaches that I battle with. Um, and most of them are still living, thank God, today. And we still, we have a big reunion down in Huntingburg every year. A bunch of old coaches, referees, you know, we're all in the 65 to 95 range. And we get about 80 of us and we meet every year, second Monday in June and uh, tell these stories. And of course the stories change a little bit after a few years, <laughs> they get a little more uh, twisted, but, but they're still fun. Now uh, Roger Kaiser fills me in on those stories that uh, get inflated every year. Dale Harris uh, is probably down there with you guys also. Hey, did Joe toe drink, was he wearing his white patent shoes or was that lit earlier in the seventies that he wore those when he coached? Yeah, that was earlier. That I didn't get to see those shoes. I heard about them, but uh, he, he kept those at home. <laughs> when we played in the early 80s, he, he didn't wear those. He, he was a little modest, I guess, back then. Coach Duncan's a character, too. Oh, my goodness. Damn, yeah. many Christmas. He beat us in the regional. The year that we won the sectional, I was telling you about, we played Southridge in the regional, and he had a tradition of doing a flip when he'd win. and. He did his flip right in front of me. I was about ready to flip him myself over three more times when he did it because uh, it was a close game. Of course, they went on to the Final Four two years in a row, and that was the second year uh, Southridge went to the Final Four. And, and again, Gary's a dear friend. We ride motorcycles together. We get out around in the summer. Still, you know, today we we like to, you know, when we can uh, try to get together and catch up. And um, and and I'm going to put in a plug for Gary he, he's you know he, I think he's going to be up for the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame so I'm going to be on his fan committee of uh, trying to get him get him some votes I totally agree with that um, so was it was it intimidating to uh, coach against Jack Butcher did you what kind of perspective how did you go what, what how what kind of attitude did you have going into the game is it really when you went into a game playing against him did you want to beat his butt oh yeah yeah, but it was intimidating. I mean, it, it was, you know, I mean, you, you I would say, uh, but here's the thing about Jack. It, we we talk off season. We had a radio show that Stan Neal and, and uh, uh, Jack and I were on because we were the three local uh, folks there in the high school. I mean, when you talk to Jack, he would be like your best buddy. I mean, Jack would, you know, he'd buy my lunch. He'd, uh, He'd do anything and everything, you know, just your best buddy. And, and before the game, when we play Lagodi, didn't matter if it was at our place or his place at Lagodi, he, the nicest guy in the world. I mean, he'd like, just, you'd think he was your, 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 your father, your brother, your, your whatever. But boy, once they threw the ball up, I, I can't even say some of the words on the air that Jack would call me during the game, if I ever got close to his bench or I ever oh. argued a call, he'd be nose to nose to me, like Worland, blah, 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 set your whatever down. And so he was intimidating without even playing against him. But boy, when you played against him, if you were able to be intimidated, you were big time intimidated with Jack Butcher. And I say that all in a in a friendship way, but he just Jack didn't like lose and he he let you know it. He he went down to the final seconds and 
if he didn't win, you you knew it. He he, he would let you know he he wasn't your friend for a little bit of that time. <laughs> I have his uh, I have his book back here. And, and it's yeah. not highlighted because the sun is coming in or he's the best. It's just, uh, it just, it's back there at that particular time. Um, right. So what gets you away from Washington Catholic and gets you back to Central Catholic? No, nope, I went to South Dearborn High School. Um, I, I, I'll tell you what it was. Um, when we won the sectional that year, again, I was, again, I was still kind of young and dumb. I still was pretty much not sure what I wanted to be yet. Other than I wanted to be uh, a head basketball coach somewhere that could win the state tournament. You know, I had that bit of a dream. And, of course, Marion High School was the school back then. You know, they were kind of up and they were always in the state and they were always uh, right up there. So I wanted to hopefully someday maybe go to a Marion High School. That would be my dream. So at Washington Catholic, I, I probably at that time I thought I probably got as far as I could if I was going to get to that next uh, level to win a state championship as a as a head basketball coach in Indiana. So I was kind of looking, and uh, Bill Slayback was someone I'd seen at clinics, and Bill's the AD and the former coach at that time Aurora High School. They consolidated with a few other schools to South Dearborn, and um, so they offered me a job, and I took it. I was just a year being married. My wife and I. Had only been married a year and it's like hey honey let's 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 go to the next uh, step and do a little stepping stone thing so we went to to south dearborn and in, in uh, there's a little four team sectional so back then what the heck you know if you could get in a tournament that wasn't highly competitive um you know uh, and it was only four teams and you hosted it south dearborn hosted that sectional so i thought hey there's a good way to get to the regional um so that was kind of it and you know i was maybe 31 or something, 30 years old, just thought, you know, what's the next step? So, so I loved it, but I couldn't see myself staying in Washington, Indiana at Washington Catholic, you know, my whole career. So I thought, you know, still young, let's see what's out there. And Janet was, she was game. She was born and raised in Washington. So she thought it'd be kind of cool to see what it'd be like going somewhere else. So I, I taught English and uh, coached basketball at South Dearborn. Bill Slayback was a great AD to work under, met some great friends there. And so I was there uh, for two years and, um, and thought I was going to stay there a lot more, but uh, I'll just throw this little story in. Um, uh, there was a, uh, a day where um, it was after my second year there and we had some success there. We, we won a lot of games and won a sectional and got to another final game of the regional Richmond beat us in the regional. And um, uh Paul Araka was the athletic director at Central Catholic back then. Uh, actually, he wasn't the athletic director. He was my athletic director when I was at Lafayette Central Catholic. But anyway, he was still very involved at Lafayette Central Catholic. And he came to South Dearborn and said, uh, hey, hey, Dave, dude, we got some openings at Central Catholic. The, the head basketball coach left. The AD left. They all went different ways. Um, AD went to McCutcheon. The basketball coach went to Franklin. And he just wanted to know, would I want to apply for the um, Lafayette Central Catholic basketball job and be the AD? And I was flattered. as like, oh, especially come from Paul. It's like, oh, my gosh, Paul Araka wants me to come back to Central Catholic. He was my, you know, he was my AD. He was, he was the head football coach that won state championships. And, uh, and I told Paul, I said, Paul, I am so honored that you would like me to be considered to go back as a head coach. But I said, I got, I got some work to do here at South Dearborn. I said, I, you know, we, we've I've only been here two years. We got, we're building the program great school, good community. And he was great. He said, okay, well, you know, I just thought I'd better check with you because we're going to post this job and just thought you'd throw your name in. So fast forward that day, I come home and my wife, Janet, we only been married a year and a half and, and she was pregnant with our first son, Lance. And she said, Hey, did, did you talk to Paul or today? And I said, yeah, how do you know? She said, well, he got a hold of me. Yeah. What's up? She said, uh, well, what do you think? That's why I told him. I said, I was honored, blah, 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 blah. But I, I'm not going anywhere. I, I like it here. South Denver, good school. Well, she started crying. She said, I think you ought to consider going back. She, she was pregnant, first kid. Um, Aurora's a nice town, but it's very rural. So she didn't really have much of a friend base there. You know, she was a kind of a stay-at-home mom for part of the time. She was pregnant. So, hey, I've been in this... Uh, business long enough if, if I can't keep her happy with what I'm doing then I can't 
you know, sustained. So long story short, I applied and got the job at Central Catholic. So uh, only two years at South Dearborn, but then we moved to Lafayette. My whole family was there, my sisters and some of them. So Janet, we're real good friends with them. So we went there and, and thank God we did because I had a great 14 years at Central Catholic. Went there as an AD and boys basketball coach. Uh, in 1990, a lot of people probably, it's weird, people don't know this, but the school closed in 1990. Lafayette Central Catholic did. Long story short, just because of dropping enrollment and financial difficulties and all that, the school closed. And at the time I was the boys basketball coach and the AD my sister Ann Kathleen was the uh, principal, uh, so school closed. So like, hey, I'm, I've only been there, you know, two years at that time. It's like, oh boy, I better find a job. Well, long story short, the community got together and the alumni and all that. We reopened again, but sister, it, it hurt her feelings quite a bit, our principal, because she kind of got blindsided on that closing. She didn't think it was going to close when it closed. That's a whole nother session. We could talk about that, but we'll move on. Um, but she left. She, she, she didn't want to remain after that whole thing. So they asked me to be the principal. And so I said, eh, you know, not against that, but I want to still coach basketball. That's my love. You know, I want to be a state championship coach and all that still. And they said, well, you can be the principal and the coach. So for, I think it was like 10 or 11 years, I was the principal and coach there. And then finally, um, Chad Dunwoody was my assistant coach. Um, and Chad was ready, man. He was, he's an excellent coach. And so I, by the time I had been a principal and coach for those nine, 10 years, whatever that was, I was ready to give up one or the other just because time was tight and uh, didn't have much of a life. Uh, so I, I did give up, you know, my coaching and then just became a principal full-time those, those last few years that I was at Central Catholic. So, so you coached against Coach Griffith at Richmond? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, just yeah. as intimidating as Jack Butcher? Uh, probably a little more so because Jack and I, we socialized a lot together, but coach Griffin and I, we didn't, so we didn't really know each other very well. So, but he was, you know, he was, he was awesome. I mean, he was very, um, you know, I, 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 I felt honored to be able to go up against him, but at the same time, uh, I was still pretty young and he was later on in his career. Um, Talk about your stance towards class basketball. Well, um, it's interesting because when that came up, you know, the vote and all that, when we went to multiple class, I was one of the advocates at that time that I wanted to keep it in one class. But it really was because of my experience as a high school player. You know, because I was blessed and fortunate enough to go through my high school year and beat the Broncos. And so I knew what it was like to be the little school winning a, a sectional championship and not winning a state championship. But that sectional was probably bigger than any state championship that I thought a single A would have or double A, triple A, whatever. So I was not an advocate of going to multiple class. Now. Uh, so I was one of the votes back then because I was a principal. So I was able to vote on that. Well, I'm glad it went the way it did. I, I was, I was wrong in, when I look back on it, I think it was the right thing to do, but I was stuck in that traditionalist mode. I didn't see the vision of what a multiple class would provide, but now I've seen it. You know, I've been able to see it, you know, as a principal, I've been able to see it. I've been on the board of directors with the IHSA the last nine 10 years somewhere in that range and so I've, I've been able to, to go to these state championships I've been able to see these multiple winners and it's not everybody gets a trophy I mean there's still not that many teams that get to be state championship you know the girls and the guys there's four state champions you know out of whatever 300 some schools so it's still an honor uh and it's and it's it's right because I do think that um um the bigger schools they've got an advantage in in the little schools although like I say, once every 29 years, you know, I haven't been in that once in 29 years, but otherwise there's going to be 28 years where people, you know, get knocked out first game or something. So, so I now stand, I think it was a great call back when that happened in 1998, whenever that was. Um, and I've seen so many things that uh, have, have built programs, built communities, 
a lot of pride. And it's not just basketball. I mean, it's it's every sport. You know, it's volleyball, it's tennis. It's I mean, not tennis because that's a you know that's a team. That's not a that could be an individual sport. But all the the team sports that have multiple uh, classes. Um, it's it's fun to watch those teams when they get to the the final sixteen, the final eight, down to the final two, and then crown a state champion, whether it's the boys or girls. Um, I I think it's the greatest thing that probably happened. I, I'm not on that fence anymore saying we should have stuck to the old way. You know, it's always interesting. You talk about the Indiana University basketball job or class basketball, and you just get a <laughs> of commentary. So it's always, you know, it's always, and it's, I, I like that take. I like how you explained uh, that class basketball and how it used to be. Uh, so, and it has worked out nicely for um, a Lafayette Central Catholic. They have done yeah. a good, they have done a really good job. They've won a state in, uh, I think, football, volleyball, and a couple state championships in basketball. Exactly. Right. And, and sometimes it's, it's not always winning the state. It's maybe winning a regional for somebody, you know, you always hear every year that a school would, uh, you know, the first time they've ever won a sectional still, you know, you get the smaller schools that'll come through, uh, whether again, name the sport, you know, it's, it's any sport. So it's, it's advancing. There are just more opportunities when you have a good team, you know, here's a good example. Now this is multiple, you know, state championships but just yesterday um we played lawrence north you know cathedral played lawrence north in basketball and so we played the first game both of us in the uh, sexual tournament we're all in 4a so that's all fair we're all you know but you know just so happened you know they were ranked two or three in the state we were ranked fourth in the state and and they they beat us you know and and that's the way that it goes but it's not that way every year you know they, there's there's going to be balanced years where you're going to be able to you know you, you get your opportunity to to beat a team and there's still upsets even in the multiple classes there's going to be upsets sometimes within that that still gives these teams an opportunity to say you know even if we were five and 15 regular season um, a team can you know because they're playing schools their size they might get in a good bracket to, to move in and, and upset somebody, um, which makes it fun and exciting. Did you go down and make sure that Jack Kiefer wasn't like a robot? Is he really human? <laughs> well, I was, I was at the top of the bleachers um, and he was too far away from me. So I don't know. I, he, he was, I don't know. He was moving around. He was talking and coaching. So he was, uh, I think he, uh, maybe some of it's on automatic pilot. He's been coaching a long time. So a lot of it, he probably just looks at his players and they know what he wants them to do. You know, we played him a couple of times in, in the Hinkle sectional uh, back in the eighties and, and what a great, you know, I, it, just because you brought it up, what a great job and what a, what a 45 year plus coaching career. What a great job he's done. Well, look at all the great coaches that have won and been successful there's not too many that are at one place practically. He, and he, he's been at other places, but he's been the only coach at Lawrence North. And that in itself tells you that, you know, he's been able to, you know, build something that's, that's pretty special and be content where he's at and work hard where he's at. And he's, uh, he's got a record to, to show for it. And, and there's not a lot of women or men that, you know, really stay at one place, you know, just like I was saying, I always wanted to move my way up and get to the best school that might have a shot at going further. Some people, they're pretty content to say, okay, I'm here. Jack Butcher, good example of Goaty. I mean, Jack was, he didn't want to go anywhere else. He, and there's people all over the place wanting him to, to go coach at their schools. And he didn't even consider it. So, so yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of real strong, committed people that believe in their school, their mission, their vision, um, there's a love uh, to, to these high schools, especially. Well, I'm going a little bit long. You got time for a couple more questions? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so what gets you to Indianapolis? What, what do you like, you know, hey, you know, it's, you know, I'm going to be principal at Cathedral High School. How, how, how do you get there? And how hard was it uh, at Central Catholic to give up the game of basketball? I know you still love it. You still watch it. You, you still you know, um, uh, go to these folk stories that you guys tell in Southern Indiana every year in June. But, um, but um, how, uh, how hard was it to walk away from coaching the game? 
it was it was it was hard in kind of an odd way. Um, it was not hard to walk away from being the coach because I got to be honest, Billy. Um, the latter part of my career as a head basketball coach at Central Catholic, part of it was the demands of being the principal of the school. Um, you know, there's a that's 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 a more important job than being a head basketball coach. Um, I had a great administrative assistant. Her name was Kathy Deanhart. Because of Kathy, I was able to coach because she was such a great assistant. And she did a lot of the work behind the scenes that I couldn't get done, but she was so efficient. Uh, I was able to have my fun being a coach. But, you know, as the years moved on, it became apparent to me that I couldn't do both because, and I, I tell people this all the time that ask me, I noticed my last year that I coached and Jason Delaney, who was our head coach here at Cathedral, he was a senior my last year as the head basketball coach at Central Catholic. Love Jason. He's awesome. Um, amazing guy. But um, Came over from Tech, right? Yeah, he was at Tech prior to coming to Cathedral. Um, but that year, Jason's senior year, uh, again, I'm kind of telling him myself, I would go to practice some days, and I never did this in my whole career, all the years I'd been coaching. Uh, I'd look at the clock. I, I remember looking at the clock in the gym saying, oh, my gosh, practice isn't over yet? Well, I knew right there, and I went home and told Janet, I said, this is my last year because I'm cheating the kids because I'm, I'm not giving my whole self and energy to coaching those boys. I was like, let's get this practice over, and that was so unfair to them. So, so it wasn't like horribly bad, but you know, I still got after it, but, but then I was it was easy because I turned over to Chad Dunwood. He'd be a full-time principal for four or five years. And, and the, so that was the other part of it, the, the hard, the hard, so that was easy to resign from that because I was just tired. I, I, I was done. The hard part was when Chad was the coach the next year, I didn't know where to sit in the gym. I didn't know what to do. I, I mean, I was lost. I was like a little puppy in the gym because the, the game, you know, warm up, I, you know, I was the principal of school, but as the principal, I was always on the bench coaching the game. So I, 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 honest to goodness, I, I was like, I don't know what to do. I didn't know how to not be a coach. Um, and it took me probably darn near 10 games before I finally could get settled down and just be a fan, you know, um, because I wasn't going to be the coach looking over shoulders or telling Chad what to do. Um, I, I would never do that. And, 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 that, and I did, but I didn't know what to do with my time. Uh, so when I finally figured out, to be a principal and, you know, kind of check on our fans and make sure that the uh, safety, you know, kind of do my spot checks. And I had a great AD that was doing those things, but, but that was a hard part. So it took me about a half a year. And then from there, you know, and then I was, I've been, I was a principal ever since until this last year, as I said, and, and it's funny, you say, you know, how did I get to cathedral? Um, I wasn't looking to go anywhere. I just wanted to, I was probably thinking I'll be the principal of Central Cali till, you know, they carry me out of here, you know, uh, in, however many years after I was there, but I met Father Pat Kelly, who was on an accreditation team at Lafayette Central Catholic early in my tenure as a principal at Lafayette Central Catholic. Well, he was a principal cathedral at the time. So we got to be good buddies. So this was like in 92, I think it was, I met Father Pat. So we, we became buds. So uh, because of that accreditation and, and he, he was kind of my mentor. Um, so when he decided to retire in uh, 2002, which is like 10 years after I met him, he said, Dave, why don't you apply for my principal's job at, at Cathedral? And it was, a, again, big honor. It was like, wow, I never thought about that, you know, biggest Catholic high school in the state. But it's like, I, I went home and I just told my three kids, which I haven't said anything about my kids. My, my, I got the three awesomest kids in the whole wide world. Lance um, is, is our oldest. He was the one that was one year old when we were at South Dearborn. Courtney uh, is one year younger than him. And then Sean's uh, three years younger than Courtney. Um, so those are my, my pride and joy. And uh, Janet's done a great job raising them during those years that I was like workaholic coaching principalship. She was uh, kept them at home and at bay, but um, it was so interesting because I went home and said, Hey, told Lance, Courtney and Sean and Janet, Hey, 
probably ought to apply for the cathedral job. They were like, they took a vote and said, zero to four, no way in heck, dad, are we leaving Lafayette Central Catholic? Because Lance was a freshman there. Courtney was an eighth grader. We were junior high, so she was an eighth grader. Then Sean was like in fifth grade at St. Boniface. And then Janet was like, she, she sided with the kids. Like, we're not moving anywhere. We're staying right here. So I said, well, I'm just going to think about it. Well, as it turned out, as it turned out, um, I told Father Kelly, I'm not going to apply for the job. And he said, well, why not? I said, well, you know, family's not real keen on it and all that kind of stuff. He said, well, you know what? He says, you probably wouldn't get it anyway. And so, and he knew me pretty well and he knew I was a competitor. So I said, you know what, Father? I'm going to apply for the job. And guess what? I'm going to try to get it. And then I'm going to turn it down because you just said I wasn't going to get it. So I did. I applied for it. Long story short, I fell in love with the place after our interview. And I was like begging to get the job practically from the committee. Um, so they offered me the job. And uh, so that was Father Kelly. You know, God rest his soul right now because he's no longer with us. But if it wasn't for him telling me, you know, you're probably not going to get it anyway, um, I probably would never have applied. And, and of course, been here 20 years and cathedral is just uh, been such a, a wonderful experience for me for my three children for my wife for our family uh, all three of our kids got to graduate from cathedral central Catholic was a great school too but you know they had the balance of the two um, so I could not have had a better career and and the greatest thing uh, when I stepped down as principal, I've got this uh, new role here that I'm in, in the advancement office, and I'm able to talk to our alums, our donors, our, our graduates, and people that were here at Cathedral 20 years ago that when I was the principal, I'm meeting with them, uh, talking to them about how they might want to get back to the dear old Cathedral. Um, I, you know, it, it was interesting, uh, like I said earlier at the, at the beginning of the show of how you know, you learn something new about Indiana high school basketball and the game of basketball. Just when you think you know everything, you learn something else new. Um, I dropped your name to uh, several people and and uh, just wanted their thoughts on you during my research. And and I got books back. Literally, I got <laughs> just uh, uh, long things of how uh, good of a guy you were, uh, of how good of a family man you were, and and, you know, uh, just, you know, even people who don't know you really well, like uh, Kenneth Barlow uh, wrote a small chapter in in describing you. Uh, uh, Coach Sean Martin, Lanny Siegel. I don't even know if you know Lanny Siegel, but he even uh, 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 told me all fabulous, wonderful things about you. So, uh, I mean, what a uh, what a fabulous career. I know that we have ran long. Uh, I appreciate your time. Uh, I don't know if we want to leave with anything with. Uh, um, um, you know, the state of the game. What do you think the state of the uh, game of basketball is in Indiana today? Well, I, I'll, I'll give you a quick comment on that, but, but my, my second to last closing comments would be, it is so great being a grandfather. You know, I've got Lillian, Ella, and Will are my grandchildren. And that's, even though I've got a great full-time job here, but when you're not the principal and you're, you don't have anybody supervised and, and you got a great person to work for, and Denise Farrell, I'm able to spend time with my grandkids. And that is the highlight of my career life and everything is being able to spend time with those three. And, and I might be blessed with a few other grandkids, sports all over. Sean and Katie just got married last October. and They talk like they might want to have a few too. So so that's that's the greatest thing. I want everybody to know that it doesn't get any better. Now, I always thought it would be like to be a grandpa, but until I was a grandpa, I, I realized that. State of basketball. I think it is going to it's going to continue to grow. I think it's it's you know, let's let's face it. Look what's going on in Indianapolis right now with with the college tournament. Everything's here, it's right here. All the tournaments going to be here in Indiana. We just started the the boys basketball sectional highlight galore. The girls basketball state tournament just finished here a while back. Um, it's it, once we can get through the pandemic, you know, uh, it's just going to continue to grow. And we've got some of the best coaches around in boys and girls uh, basketball, every level, kindergarten up to varsity. We got awesome colleges here in Indiana. So it's, it's going to go nowhere but up. Um, I think our parents in, in, in across the state, thanks to the IHSAA with sportsmanship, uh, Sandra Walters and Paul Neidig and Chris Kaufman and all the, the assistant commissioners um, are great leaders in that area. So I think 
uh, we're the best state in the union when it comes to being able to have this awesome sport. And it's only going to get better because we've, we, we, even though we paused a little bit this last year with the pandemic, um, we're going to have a state champion this year in boys basketball. And we didn't last year because of the, it was a brand new, you know, pandemic. We didn't know what was going on back then. We just got blindsided. But, but now that we're getting over that, um, you know, I just look in the back of your uh, pictures back there of just all the history. And, and that is awesome history, uh, Billy. And, and I can kind of go up and down memory lane looking at the back. But in 50 years from now, there's going to be 10 times the greatness that we're going to be able to have here in Indiana to tell about this awesome game of basketball. Uh, what did the grandchildren call you, Grandpa? Papa. 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 And they got that on their own. I didn't tell them what to call me. They just came up with it. They just, so I'm Papa. So they. Uh, I have an Ella in, uh, I have Ella and a Heidi and they call me G-Paw. Oh, how'd the G get in there? I don't know, but I was kind of excited for it. So, uh, and. It's nice uh, that's done a little unique, right? Uh, uh, yes. Nope. And I do have gray hair. I just have a hat to to hide it. So. <laughs> okay. I do have all white, but I do, I do got some hair, you know, I did a little bit on there. The The sun's shining on it. So it probably looks like I'm bald, but it, it is, uh, I do got a little bit on there. <laughs> Coach Dave Warland, what, what a, uh, an exceptional interview. I'm sure everybody is going to enjoy this. I, I thank you for your time and uh, uh, you know, the, the stories can't be remembered if they're not told. And I thank you for helping to keep the nostalgia alive. Oh, I'm very honored and uh, look forward to continuing uh, doing what I can do for, for not only basketball, but all the kiddos that I went across here at Cathedral and throughout Indiana.